because there are a lot of research open opportunities in the face arrays and i think uh, your uh, uh, lectures and your guidance in this area is very very uh, uh, appreciated and uh, at, at least at the towards the end my request is give some guidance to these uh, students how to go at the research area research uh, initiatives in this space ready and now once again not um, continue uh, thanks once again for uh, coming to uh, i triple uh, lecture series and another this is another honor for uh, i triple section because your presence itself is a honor for the mdts society thanks a lot once again uh, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, dm uh, distribution uh, dl talk thank you thank you professor jeffrey and i welcome our professor siddiqui and uh, dr uh, the uh, dc pandey and all distinguished um, guests who are attending this uh, talk thanks once again over to manu thank you sir now i invite dr ajmal shah former chair at entropy mbts kerala chapter to say a few words about the speaker thank you arjun uh, at the outset uh, let me extend a very good morning to the speaker uh, professor zefri and uh, the session chair professor siddiqui and good evening to all my distinguished friends colleagues and some of the very senior people in spite of their uh, you know huge responsibilities and other commitment they are here like uh, dr pandey and some of my other senior friends also i want to take much time just uh, in presence of professor zefri i want to keep on record on few facts that uh, today's uh, gml talk distinguished microwave lecture talk is probably seventh or eighth uh, gml talk which is being organized by our chapter at mgts kala chapter and many of the things we have jointly uh, you know done together with antenna propagation society so if we consider that then definitely it is above uh, double digit maybe 10th or uh, 12th talk in this one and during the pandemic our chapter has you know taken different kind of initiatives especially in the academic fronts we started a new talk series which was named as learn from leaders and learn from legends so that was not a dml talk but the speakers their profile their expertise or something like dml so in considering that today's dml talk by professor zefri i can consider it as a another version of our l4 talk and uh, for your information all these talks are archived in youtube so that the future generation students current students can get benefited we have more than 15 uh, l4 talks and more than 7 to 8 dml talks which are already there in the youtube link of mtts kala chapter and during pandemic we had a very tough time that we thought of when all the academic institutions research labs were completely stopped we thought of at least you know giving some kind of technical support to our students so we organized not only this kind of talks but some kind of panel discussion some kind of students talk omen in micro web talk uh, i think the space antenna workshop you know some special talks on wireless power transfer etc so we are trying our best for last two and a half years and i want to keep also on record that all these activities have been immensely supported by society leaders a society a uh, presidents i remember professor ala and then uh, current president professor rashaun the president elect professor nuno so everyone has blessed and appeared in our podium virtually uh, my sincere thanks to some of the leaders like uh, dr gautam from jpl nasa Professor Shibon Call, uh, you know, Region 10 Coordinator of MT MTTS. Professor Siddiqui, who is part of MTTS Atcom and APS Atcom, is the current uh, chair of the APS site, and many other committees of ITLP Antenna Propagation site and hack committees. So these people have actually guided us immensely, and all the benefits that students are deriving uh, out of this guidance, uh, I must, uh, you know, extend my sincere acknowledgement to all of them. so just wanted to keep all the few points on record and i am sure that today's talk will be highly beneficial to all of you because phased array is such a topic it is it is never you know 
never uh, you know old or uh, it's it's coming in a new way because with the new 5g especially the millimeter wave 5g technologies coming in picture and also wireless power transfer coming into picture far field based wpt especially the point of phase array uh, and of course some other concept like time modulated arrays etc are also there and a phase array is such a topic is like always uh, very very useful like a classical music it, it will always be very very useful and i am sure professor zethri stock i have seen his profile and his uh, recent publications so he doesn't require any introduction his technical talk i am sure will uh, benefit lot of our young students especially the phd students and young faculty members and i am sure they will uh, you know uh, note down various points and that would help them in their future research and academic endeavor and my sincere thanks to all the student volunteers current office bearers dr apren uh, you know vice chair dr shukomol uh, mr orijit uh, professor anu mohammad and all the vibrant student of volunteers because of them we are here and because of them some of the applauds and uh, you know recognition from the society side as dr apren mentioned we have received so we are uh, maybe in the you know limelight or front side but they are our backbone they are always working in the back side and we are because of they yeah. match so without adding anything further i want to stop it here because we are eagerly waiting to hear professor uh, zefri and i am sure all of you will enjoy the talk and note down various points and we will have a very faith, uh, fruitful interaction uh, thank you very much once again uh, professor zefri professor siddiqui dr apren uh, thank you uh, over to you manu Thank you, sir. Now I invite the session chair, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, to introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aprin, um, for organizing this event. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Dancer, for agreeing to this event. I'll, without uh, much ado, I'll directly introduce the speaker to the audience. Dr. Jeffrey Nancer uh, received his uh, BS degree in electrical engineering and computer engineer from Michigan State University, East Lansing, Michigan, USA in 2003, and MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Texas, Austin, uh, USA in 2005 and 2008, respectively. From 2008 to 2009, he was a postdoctoral fellow with applied research laboratories, um, the university, uh, the antennas and communication systems, uh, and he, sorry, he was in the University of Texas Austin, where he was involved in designing electrical small high frequency antennas and communication systems from 2009 to 2016. He was with the uh, John Hopkins uh, University Applied Physics Laboratory, Laurel, uh, uh, USA, where he created and led the advanced microwave and millimeter wave technology section. In, 2016, he joined the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Michigan State University, where he's currently the Dennis P. Nyquist Associate uh, Professor. He has authored or co-authored more than 150 reference journal and conference papers, authored the book Microwave and Millimeter Wave Remote Sensing for Security Applications, published by Arctic House, and co-authored chapters in books, Wireless Transceiver Circuits, by, uh, published by Taylor and Francis in 2015 and short-range micro-motion sensing, hardware signal processing, and machine learning by IE, published by IET in 2019. His current research interest includes distributed arrays, radar and remote sensing, antennas, electromagnetics, and microwave photonics. Dr. Nancer was a founding member for the first and the first treasurer of the IEEE uh, APS and MTTS Central Texas chapter. He is also a member of the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society Education Committee and uh, the USNCRC Commission B. He was a recipient of the Outstanding Young Engineer Award from the IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society in 2019. Uh, the recipient of the DARPA Director's Fellowship in 2019 and the recipient of the National Science Foundation NSF Career Award in 2018, the DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2017, and the JHU APL Outstanding Professional Book Award in 2012. He has served as a vice chair of the for the IEEE Antenna Standards Committee 
from 2013 to 2016 and the chair of the microwave systems technical committee mtt 16 of the i of the microwave uh, theory and technique society from 2016 to 2018 he's also an associate editor of the IEEE transactions transactions and antennas and propagation so uh, with such an illustrious career, uh, career and um, his talk today will be on distributed phase arrays challenges and recent progress so over to you dr nancy very much for, for that introduction. Let me go ahead and bring up my slides. Make sure you can all see them okay. Okay, does that look all right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. All right. You. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And it's it's great to be here with you virtually. And it's great to hear about the um, uh, how how interactive and exciting your your local chapter is. It's always excellent to hear. Um, and you know, before I get into the technical stuff, I want to talk a little bit, you know, sort of in that area because I'm here as a representative also of IEEE and MTT. And so I do want to encourage those of you listening, if you're not already, to become an I to become a member of IEEE or MTT. There's a lot of benefits that are associated with being a member uh, in terms of uh, lower costs for the top journals in the field that we all know about the top conferences. But one of the things I want to point out, and this is, I think, relevant to, um, you know, how how you have your local chapter running, is that there are a lot of volunteer opportunities and special interest groups that you can get involved in an MTT and an IEEE. And it's it's been this is something I've been involved in in my own career um, since you know since I was in graduate school getting involved in volunteering at local chapters at conferences um, uh, internet you know in the committees um, uh, for MTT and IEEE and it's just been a hugely rewarding experience for me. Um, not only do you um, get to build your professional network, um, you, but you get to see kind of the behind the scenes at IEEE and MTT, and you get to have a hand in kind of how the future of the society is, is going to run. But also you just meet a lot of really outstanding people, um, make connections that are going to last for your entire career. Um, and it's just a hugely rewarding experience. So I encourage you, I know this is a very active um, uh, uh, a local chapter, and that's really uh, wonderful to hear. So I encourage you to look for these volunteer opportunities, get involved in your local chapter, get involved in the international um, uh, committees as well. It's just a hugely rewarding experience. I won't dwell too much on the publications. You um, are, are probably very familiar that MTT has the, you know, the top publications in our field and the top conferences in our field. Um, and, you know, again, the, the conferences and the local events will give you a lot of opportunities uh, to get involved and to volunteer. And, you know, I think particularly the local chapters are always looking for volunteers uh, to help. Um, and there are various committees that are always welcoming volunteers. So, you know, do look out for those opportunities, contact people, see how you can help out. If you're not a member, I, I have a breakdown of the cost here. I'm happy to come back to this at the end of the talk if you'd, if you'd like to uh, see these in more detail. Okay, so so with that, I'll get into the technical portion of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to start by just discussing what distributed phase arrays are, what their challenges are in terms of the coordination aspects. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about different topologies um, that have been investigated in the literature in order to coordinate distributed phase arrays. Um, we'll go into microwave technologies uh, that have been developed for uh, achieving wireless phase coherent coordination between separate platforms to, to implement distributed phase arrays, and then how these are built on uh, for some dis demonstration systems, distributed uh, phased array uh, experimental systems. The last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss some open challenges in distributed phased arrays um, and some opportunities that these types of systems afford for new research directions that we think are, are very exciting. So with a distributed phased array, what we're trying to do is overcome some of the limitations of single platform uh, phased array systems. So it's been traditional in our field in previous decades when we're looking to increase the capabilities of a wireless system, uh, whether it's increasing the gain or the directivity or the throughput or the, sen or the SNR, uh, if it's a radar system. What we often look to do is to increase the aperture size of our phased array, we might look at increasing the efficiency or the gain of the uh, of the amplifiers that are used behind each element. 
And there's been a lot of really outstanding developments in these, you know, in the in in the areas of these single aperture, single platform systems. But they they do have inherent limitations in terms of how large you can make the systems, particularly for things like satellites. It's very hard to launch very large systems, um, and there are limitations or um, challenges involved with increasing you know gain and efficiency of active components as well. And so with a distributed phase array. What we're looking to do is to disaggregate the functionality of this single large system into a collection of smaller systems that are wirelessly coordinated, and these platforms may be in motion. I'm showing each system here as a, as a phased array, a smaller phased array, but these uh, could also be single antenna elements or they could be subarrays as I'm showing here. So there are two interesting aspects with distributed phase arrays, two things that my, my group has been very active in. One is looking at the design and use of the radiation characteristics of these systems. When you have a sparse aperture and the elements are, are coherently um, synchronized or coordinated at the, you know, at the wavelength level um, and it's sparse, we have a very interesting radiation pattern that results from this. And particularly when the, when the nodes are in motion, when we have dynamics, there's some very interesting things that we can do um, in terms of different types of measurements. Um, and so we'll talk about that um, later in the talk, but before we can envision using these types of systems, um, what we have to do is coordinate them such that they operate coherently. And so that means, you know, implementing the technologies that are indicated by these arrows between them. We have to wirelessly synchronize them so that they look like a single large uh, self-coherent system. And this is where most of the challenges in distributed phase arrays arise. And so we'll talk about technologies that have been developed to address the fundamental aspects or the fundamental challenges of, of this coordination. And we'll, we'll touch on some open challenges um, and some interesting directions that are aimed at uh, uh, overcoming some of the open challenges. So some of the applications that distributed phase arrays can be beneficial for um, are, are shown here on this on the slide. So we, 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 we focus a lot on things like uh, satellites, uh, constellations, aerial vehicles, things like that. And so when we're looking at increasing the capabilities of a remote sensing system um, of the earth or a different celestial object or a communication system from space to ground it gets increasingly difficult to launch larger and larger apertures and um, and so what we're interested in doing is coordinating collections of smaller elements so that they can mimic the performance of those, of those larger systems. But also, as we'll discuss later in the talk, there are some things that these highly distributed apertures can do that single platform systems cannot. And so we can actually get functionality out of these that um, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't be able to get otherwise with a single platform. And of course, when we've seen like uh, the Starlink satellites that are being launched, um, you know, by, by, by SpaceX, you know, there's 50, 60 of these small sats at a time. And so we can envision architectures where we're wirelessly coordinating these um, these nodes and these platforms. And if a few of them fail, um, it's 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 not so big of a deal because the rest of the system is still functioning. And we can always add more nodes to the array with either these large launches, or we can tack on these smaller systems onto existing launches. And so it's a very scalable approach um, to uh, to remote sensing and communications. The same types of um, benefits apply to aerial um, characteristics. So I'm going to jump over you know, to the right hand side here um, at Michigan State University where I work. We're, we're an agricultural university. And so there's a lot of um, interest in things like precision agriculture, improving irrigation uh, characteristics. And so we can envision architectures like uh, drones or UAVs that are coordinated and um, doing passive or, or uh, a remote sensing of the of the earth to look for soil moisture content. And when we've got a larger aperture, we can get to much finer resolution than we can with a single aperture. And so we we're interested in looking at getting down to things, you know, like single single crop type estimation so we can get to really accurate um, uh, soil moisture estimation so we can improve the efficiency of irrigation. 
down you know closer to earth on the surface here we're also very interested in uh, autonomous vehicles uh, at michigan state university and so one of the concepts um you know that we're, we're we're looking at is coordinating not only separate vehicles the sensors on separate vehicles coordinating those coherently but also vehicle to infrastructure um, and things like that and so that we can improve situational awareness or environmental sensing and lead to better safety in autonomous or even semi-autonomous vehicles um, so in, this is, these are all sensing aspects, but in addition, in addition to sensing, there are a number of um, uh, communications aspects that um, are also benefit that could also benefit from from distributed phase array. So when we look at you know the future of wireless systems, are going to five G higher and higher frequencies. There are many more issues with blockage and occlusions at these at these frequencies, and so if we have multiple coherent connections. Not only can we overcome a lot of these blockages because we have multiple links, but also we've got multiple signals that are coherently uh, incident on our user. And that means that our throughput, our signal to noise ratio is higher and therefore our throughput can be higher. So we get much uh, greater um, uh, capacity in these in these links when we use a distributed phased array. And all these concepts can be used sort of in conjunction. We can en envision things like uh, constellations of platforms around the moon or some other celestial object communicating to the deep space network and then doing remote sensing down uh, to the Earth. So all these applications have a number uh, uh, or have a lot of potential to benefit uh, from distributed phased arrays. So some of the specific benefits when we look at what does a distributed array um, get you in terms of um, uh, performance. One of the main ones we often look at is enhanced signal gain. So when we've got a sing, when we've got a, a collection of small platforms, we have and they're transmitting, we have a benefit in terms of the amount of power we're sending out. We just have more elements, so we've just got more more power that we're sending. So we get an increase um, in the number uh, uh, by the number of elements in, in the power. Um, but we also get directivity if they're coherently um, synchronized, then we get uh, directivity on transmit as well. And then on receive, if we're uh, coherent on receive, we get directivity on receive. So now we have an N cubed increase in the signal strength um, when we do a full duplex operation. And this comes from the aggregation of the power and the directivity. And so for even a small number of nodes in the array, when we compare to a non-coherent operation, one that is not coherently synchronized, even you know just transmit or transmit and receive, we get a very significant increase in the signal strength and so this leads to greater sensitivity if it's a radar system, a greater throughput if it's a communication system. And so just the, the raw signal gain that we get out of it is a huge driving factor. The other benefit of looking at signal gain is it's a nice sort of concise metric, and we actually use this to characterize how well we're synchronizing our systems. In addition to that, there are these, um, you know, maybe less tangible uh, benefits, but no less impactful. Uh, things like increased reliability as i mentioned earlier there's no single point of failure if you coordinate these um, uh, appropriately um, and that means if one of the nodes is it fails or it's interfered with or something of that nature the rest of the system still functions and so you have a a more reliable uh, type of a wireless system Distributed phase arrays are also scalable. We can add more nodes to the array. We can remove nodes to the array. Um, they're wirelessly coordinated, and so we can, you know, we can envision, um, uh, uh, you know, growing the array sizes by adding more nodes, um, separating the array into smaller uh, subarrays, and functioning independently, and then recombining into a single array to form that function again. Um, and this kind of gets into the adaptability aspect as well, because it's wirelessly coordinated, they're distributed, they may be in motion. We we can change the nature of this array in response to changing conditions or changing requirements. And so the last kind of aspect, as I've touched on uh, earlier, is this greater spatial diversity. So we have a wider array of elements covering a larger physical area than we can get with a single platform. So we do get narrower beams out of it. We also do get grading lobes. We'll talk about that later in the talk. Um, but there are uh, benefits to having this increased spatial diversity that, uh, again, we just can't get with a single platform. So when we're implementing a distributed phase array, what we're trying to do is get the transmission of multiple elements to arrive at some destination such that they add um, uh, coherently. So we get a, a coherent superposition of these signals. And so there's a few basic things that have to happen in order for this to work. First, they have to arrive in phase. They have to arrive at the same phase at the, at the destination. 
they have to stay in phase over the course of the waveform. And then the information that's carried on that uh, carrier has to be um, has to be time aligned as well. And so if you look at those those different aspects, uh, we can look at the impacts of what happens if we don't get this coordination right. So on the left, I'm showing uh, two signals. These are BPSK signals. Um, so they have 180 degree phase shift every symbol and showing the perfect summation of these two signals. When we do everything right, they're in phase, they stay in phase, and their symbols are, are overlined appropriately. We get this nice uh, increase in the signal, so our signal strength is increased. We get all the nice benefits out of it. So if we don't align the, uh, the phases appropriately, we can be in a situation where we have almost, you know, 180 degree phase shift between the two, which is what's shown here, and we get this, you know, nulling basically of our signal, and so we can get a really um, you know, low signal power, and so that can really counteract, um, you know, our benefit here of getting the, the gain if we don't get that phase right. And this this phase piece is actually absolutely critical um, in a distributed phase phase array operation. But even if we get the signals aligned in phase at the start, if they don't stay in phase, if the frequencies are different, then there's going to be a phase rotation, and then we're going to get constructive and destructive interference over the course of the waveform. So that's what's shown here. This is frequency mismatch. So, you know, even though they might start in phase, they're going to gradually rotate in and out of um, this um, uh, constructive and destructive interference just due to the to changing phase difference. So phase and frequency um, are very important in order to maintain coherence of our transmitted signal. Importantly, you know, for phase and frequency, this happens at the at the carrier frequency level. So um, the absolute levels that we have to do this are down to the wavelength level. So the information that rides on top of it is a little bit different. So if we look at time alignment, what we're trying to do is get the envelope of our pulse, if we're sending a pulse, or the uh, duration of our signal, if the, or a symbol, if this is a communication signal, we're trying to get those to overlap appreciably. Uh, if we don't do that, so what we're showing here is about a 50% mismatch in the overlap. This is a BPSK signal, so it's rotating about 180 degrees every time. And so we kind of get this nulling of the signals. Um, uh, at every uh, at halfway through each, each each symbol, and that's going to corrupt the data. So importantly, time alignment has to do with the information, and so the absolute level at which this has to be aligned is is actually less, much less stringent than for phase and frequency, which has to happen at the carrier frequency, um, uh, at the wavelength level. So phase and frequency tend to be uh, much more challenging to implement. This has been a big focus of our research and of and that of others in distributed phase rate technologies. And so I'm going to focus in this talk on phase alignment and frequency uh, 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 and frequency alignment as well, and how we do that wirelessly. Before we jump into the technologies for that, what we want to do is look at the you know, how well do we have to coordinate them? I'm showing just some notional examples of what happens if the phase is misaligned, if the frequencies aren't, aren't matched, but we'd like to know how well we need to coordinate them before we do that. So we can look at the summation of a signal with different errors associated with it. So this, this model here has a number of different errors in terms of propagation channels, time delays, uh, et cetera. What we're gonna be interested in looking at um, initially is just what is the total, you know, phase error that we can tolerate. Um, and then, you know, frequency rolls into that frequency mismatch over a given length of time ends up being a phase difference. And so the frequency mismatch will roll into the phase. And so we want to look at um, the summed signal in the presence of these errors relative to an ideal signal shown here. So we've got a beam forming signal here. Um, and what we're showing explicitly here is the beam forming operation. And so when we do a beam steering operation, we're sending signals from two or, or from more nodes to a destination, and given a certain angle, they have to offset their phase so that we get a coherent phase front in a given direction. So in order to do that, we have to estimate the separation of the platforms. We also have to estimate the angle, and in our experience in our research, the separation of the platforms is a much more challenging um, aspect uh, to estimate. So this is this is the signal of this is the signal that we get if we cohere things ideally. And so we want to look at that and compare it to our received signal with errors. And the metric we use for that we call the coherent gain. And this is the power in our received signal with errors relative to the power in our ideal received signals. And we can so this varies between zero and one. And we can implement all of our errors in our system as a collection of random variables, and we can evaluate the probability that our coherent gain exceeds some threshold value. Now, typically, we'll pick 90%. This means we get a coherent um, beamforming gain uh, degradation relative to ideal of, of less than half a dB. 
Um, and so again, I as I talked about earlier, coherent gain is sort of a nice metric um, that can be used because it's sort of a nice quantitative way of saying that the signals uh, are aligned. And so this is something that we use um, to characterize how well we're coordinating them. So we look at this 90% um, threshold and we want to look at the probability that um, our, our system is going to achieve this 90% uh, threshold. Now, there are a number of different errors that um, that come into this model. And what we're just looking at here is just a couple of specific uh, sort of cuts through this multivariate uh, space. And the first one is the total phase error. So this would be inclusive of beam steering errors, clock errors, anything like that. And so what we can look at is the probability that our coherent gain exceeds this 90% threshold as the standard deviation in this error increases. And then we've got curves for different array sizes, so I'll look at arbitrarily large numbers of elements in the array. And what we see is we have this, um, this, this distinct cutoff here at about 18 degrees. And so if our total phase error is below 18 degrees, we're almost guaranteed to get high levels of coherent gain. And above that, um, we're, it's, it's very challenging to get high levels of coherent gain. So this 18 degrees kind of gives us an up, you know, sort of a bound on where we want to operate when we're looking at coordinating systems. We want to make sure we're within this 18 degree phase error. So that's for the total phase error. But one of the principal aspects when we look at a distributed beam forming operation, again, is implementing that phase steering in order to steer, in order to direct the beam or to direct a coherent phase front in a given direction. So in order to do that, we have to estimate the separation of the platforms. And so if we just look at the error tolerance on estimating this platform separation, so the standard deviation on that interplatform um, range error as a, uh, in terms of wavelength, um, what we get is very similar curves to what we got for a phase error, but this again is for, for position or, or relative distance error. And this comes out to be about a 15th of a wavelength. And so if we're talking about microwave or millimeter wave frequencies, this is centimeters or millimeter, um, millimeter type um, uh, range estimation that we need bet between the platforms. And this can be very challenging to implement in, in microwave systems. Um, one thing it's important to note is this doesn't exactly match the curves for the phase error because we're assuming that the steering angle is is randomized to a random variable. So for broadside to the array, um, their, their separation is kind of immaterial. It's still going to get a nice coherent operation. For end fire, that's kind of worst case. And so this kind of aggregates all those different um, uh, uh, angles into, into this, this, this plot here. And again, this 15th of a wavelength is what we're after. So if we want to align the phases of our system so that when we transmit our signals, they align in phase, we have to um, align our total phase error within, eight, within 18 degrees. We have to estimate the separation of the platforms to a 15th of a wavelength. And these are very challenging things uh, to implement in uh, microwave systems, particularly microwave systems that are moving. So that's the kind of the total phase error. We can look at different um, plots of this uh, for all the different types of error terms that, that crop up in terms of time and, and things like that. Um, we're going to be mostly interesting, mostly interested um, uh, in this talk in this basic aspect of aligning the phases. We we absolutely have to get the phases aligned in order for a distributed beam steering operation. We'll touch on other aspects of or other challenges uh, later in the talk, but this this getting this this phase aligned is is kind of one of the principal aspects that has to happen for distributed phase arrays. So we talked about you know this 18 degree sort of upper bound, but there's a lot of um, and, and how we have to estimate the distances in order to get um, um, in order to get a good beam steering operation. But there's a lot of system aspects that that can manifest that will aggregates into a phase error and we have to uh, take note of these or account for them in some cases to make sure we're below that 18 degrees. So the things like phase noise in the oscillators, platform vibration, relative Doppler between the platforms or just uh, system phases, um, you know, just phase delays through the transceivers um, can all, will, will all add to that, um, that total phase error. And so these have to be characterized or accounted for. So some of them we can calibrate or we can minimize them. So something like a system phase delay, we can measure the, um, you know, the phase delay through our transceivers. It might be time varying. We can correct that with a lookup table if it is, um, but that's sort of a static thing we can characterize and we can we can adjust for. Relative Doppler between the platforms, that's something we can uh, potentially measure and offset. But some of the things are a little bit harder um, you know, to characterize things like vibration. So vibrating uh, uh, platforms, if you've got something like a helicopter that's got a really strong vibration profile, 
when we're measuring that distance, we have to measure the distance and perform a beam forming operation before the vibration of those platforms move them out of a coherence length. And so it's important to characterize what the vibration of the platform is, how fast you need to update in order to maintain that high level of coherent gain. And so if we look at something like a jet that has a, you know, a, a smoother vibration profile than a helicopter aircraft, we can see the update rates that we need to maintain a high level of coherent gain um, are much uh, shorter for um, a helicopter. So we have to, we have to um, update these at a much faster rate um, for that uh, a helicopter because when we measure that distance, um, just because of the strength of that vibration profile, it might push it out of a coherence length. And so this gives us a sense of how fast we need to do the synchronization, how fast we need to do the coordination. Uh, for typical, typical platforms, if we're looking at, you know, upper microwave, low millimeter wave frequencies, this is somewhere on the order of, you know, millis 10 milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. So not unreasonable, um, but something that has to be kept in mind. Other aspects like the oscillator phase noise um, similarly manifest in terms of the update frequency or the update period that we need uh, to implement. So if we've got a system where we've got a primary oscillator distributing its frequencies to secondary oscillators, we're going to have phase noise profiles on the primary, on the phase lock loop, and on the secondary, and we'll get sort of an aggregate, aggregate um, uh, uh, phase noise profile that we can use to determine what that phase error is going to be at different frequencies and different update rates. And of course, if we have um, a high stability os oscillator, it's going to be it's going to be um, stable between uh, updates for a longer period than a than a standard quartz crystal oscillator. And what that means is our update times or update periods can be much longer for a high stability oscillator. They have to be much shorter for a standard oscillator or a noisy oscillator. There are also aspects in terms of jitter. If we have really low cost oscillators, uh, timing jitter that can that can cause aspects uh, that can decrease that can decrease the coherent gain as well. Um, but the the sort of you know the takeaway from the the impact of the phase noise is that there's an update rate that you that you have to implement uh, sort of a uh, an upper range and that that again comes out to be on sort of the tens of milliseconds milliseconds ten to millisecond type range um, for typical oscillators and so for vibration profiles for you know drone type aircraft for typical oscillators you know we're looking at synchronization times on the order of tens of mil ten milliseconds. Uh, or so, and so this is kind of a number that we look at, and it's it's not absurdly high, it's not um, particularly slow, but it's something that is definitely feasible. So these are some of the aspects um, that that roll into the the coordination challenges. So let's talk about some of the topologies that have been envisioned for um, correcting all these uh, these phase and frequency and timing errors. There are two general er, uh, two general categories um, that we look at for this coordination. The first is closed loop, and closed loop refers to a distributed array that has a signal feedback from the destination that it's sending its information to. So here I'm showing a base station. We've got a collection of nodes. They send a signal to the base station. That base station sends us a feedback signal um, in return to these these nodes in the array. Um, and so in this case, um, there are some benefits uh, for doing this closed loop uh, approach, which is that there's um, less information that we need than a full, what we call an open loop uh, topology, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but in this case, you know, we, we could use frequency locking, um, but we don't really need to know where the elements are. We don't need to know their positions. I talked about this beam steering operation previously. We actually don't need to know that in a closed loop system. And you can do this coordination with as little as even one bit of information, just the base station saying signal is better or signal is worse. The array can eventually converge to a coherent state. The challenge with this is that this type of array can only beam steer to this destination where that feedback is coming from. So it's, it's not a beam steering operation in, in, in that sense. It's more of a, a directed energy operation onto this base station and using that feedback to you know, cohere those signals at that base station. Um, and so it doesn't really allow uh, beam steering to arbitrary directions and it requires this feedback signal. So it's really um, only really tuned well for communication. So you can't really use it for remote sensing where there's no feedback signal from that destination. So radar remote sensing uh, aren't applicable for these uh, types of topologies. It can be time consuming um, to converge to that state, particularly if you've got something like only one bit of feedback. Um, it can take a lot of time before it converges to that. And so if these platforms are in motion, it may, be, it may not be feasible to use that type of approach. 
Um, and lastly, each of these individual nodes have to be able to form a link to this base station. So if you want to rely on the array gain to close that link, this type of approach is, is also um, uh, challenging to implement because each of these nodes in this case has to get that base station signal, at least initially, in order to determine that its, its state needs to change in a certain way. Um, and so again, closed loop really only um, beneficial for um, uh, communications or similar type of operations. So the other type of approach is open loop. And in this case, there's there, there's no signal coming from the destination. So the destination might be a base station. It might just be a spot on the ground if we're doing radar remote sensing. Um, and so what that means is the array has to align itself. Everything has to happen within the array. And so I'm kind of indicating this by showing some thicker lines here, but it's actually uh, significantly more challenging to get this type of synchronization going than in an open loop uh, architecture than it is in a closed loop ar architecture. So they have to be frequency and phase aligned as we talked. We have to know the relative positions of them. The benefit of this is it allows us to beam steer to any direction. We can do any wireless operation. As long as these nodes can self-align and cohere themselves um, at the wavelength level, we can do radar, we can do remote sensing, we can do communications, we can do any wireless operation. Um, doesn't require this feedback signal from the destination. And so we have a lot of flexibility into what we can do with it in terms of wireless uh, operations. The Challenges, um, again, more coordination between the nodes. That's what you know we'll focus on in, in the coming slides. Um, the other issue is the channel errors between the target and the destination, or between the nodes and the destination are, are not inherently corrected. And so if we've got a near field uh, target, we have to know the position we're sending it to um, in order to make sure those signals go here. Um, and so often we'll look at something like a far field type of operation. Um, and uh, in that sense, we're just looking at this sort of beam steering operation. Uh, so it's angle dependent beam steering operation, as we talked about before. Um, and so when we have targets close to the array, this performance can be uh, degraded. But the benefits of this, again, are that we can really do any wireless operation in terms of radar remote sensing. So there's a lot of um, uh, applications that can benefit from this, as we talked about earlier. So. What we want to focus on is how we can um, implement technologies that will allow us to get to the um, uh, levels of phase co uh, coordination that will allow high coherent gain, as we talked about before, this 18 degree phase error, this lambda over 15 um, uh, position um, estimation or relative uh, position estimation between the nodes. This is, this is very challenging to implement. So what we wanted to do is look at uh, first how we can implement a technology that will allow us to estimate the distance between these platforms very accurately. Now, there are a few different technologies we can use to do this. One is uh, optical. Optical just has lots and lots of bandwidth. And so we can send an optical signal. We can estimate that delay very, very accurately. Um, you know, well below this lambda over, uh, lambda over 15 at the frequencies we're interested in. The, the challenges with optical systems are, are scalability, really. Um, particularly if you're going over long distances, we need things like adaptive optical terminals. Um, we can't really form very large numbers of connections, um, and the pointing acquisition and tracking is extremely difficult. So we want something that's more of a broadcast, you know, something just like a microwave um, link that we don't have to deal with the pointing acquisition and, and tracking as much. There's there's no adaptive optics uh, type terminals that we need, and something that we can communicate with multiple links simultaneously, multiple nodes simultaneously. And so in order to do that, we we stepped back and we looked at the, um, you know, sort of the underlying theory on delay estimation. You know, when we send out a signal between these two nodes, if we're sending out a signal to one node, that node is going to active, re actively repeat it back to that first node, and we're going to estimate that delay, and it's going to tell us the distance between them. So what impacts that accuracy? There are two principal things that come into that. They're both dependent on the waveform, of course. And the first is the signal to noise ratio. So one over the, um, this is um, basically one over the uh, signal to noise ratio, this two alpha squared amplitude of the signal over the noise power spectral density. And the second is this mean squared bandwidth term. Um, mean squared bandwidth is the second moment of the energy spectrum of the signal. And so we want to minimize this variance. This is our delay estimate. We want to minimize this variance. So that tells us we want to maximize the SNR, of course, um, but we also want to maximize this mean squared bandwidth. So in order to do that, this mean squared bandwidth being the second moment of the energy spectrum, what we want to do is concentrate all the energy into the side bands of a given uh, bandwidth. And so what that looks like, if we've got fractional bandwidth of some notional signal, 
And um, here we've got a uniform or a filled bandwidth. Um, this is what you would see for like a linear frequency modulated waveform. Um, and then the relative, uh, this is the uh, mean squared bandwidth here. So as we concentrate that energy more to the sideband, same amount of energy, just concentrated into two tones at the sidebands, we get this increase in factor of three. So we get an improvement in the accuracy. Um, and so what this type of waveform looks like, you know, if we compare an LFM to a two tone is, is something like this. Um, you know, we've got our filled bandwidth here with the LFM, we got our two tone waveform here. So this gets us better accuracy. The other thing it gets us is easier hardware implementation. So if we look at these waveforms, you know, we're showing 100 megahertz bandwidth here. If we wanted to extend this to wider and wider bandwidths, which will give us better and better accuracy, it gets increasingly difficult to implement a system where we can generate a wide band linear frequency modulated waveform. We need high speed digitizers. Um, we need, you know, um, uh, up converters and amplifiers that have, you know, nice passband ripple and things like that. And it's very hard to do when we're talking about hundreds of megahertz or even gigahertz bandwidths. In contrast, this two tone waveform, it's only two tones. We can place these two tones anywhere we want and we don't have to have a signal in between them. So that has a lot of benefits in terms of the hardware implementation. So with this two tone waveform, not only do we more closely get to the optimal waveform um, that we'd want for delay estimation accuracy, but it gives us uh, an easier way of implementing this, this type of ranging in, in microwave hardware. Now, when we look at the matched filter output of these two signals, linear frequency modulated waveform gives us our sync um, uh, type shape as we, as we expect, and we have these nice low side lobes. The challenge with our two-tone waveform is we have ambiguities. And now, fortunately, we're using this in a cooperative system. We're sending out the signal from one node, it's coming back from the second node, actively retransmitted. Uh, so we're going to get a nice point source like response and so we really don't um, uh, have to worry too much about ambiguities falling on top of one another we just have to worry about disambiguating the correct lobe and it turns out there are some pretty straightforward ways of doing this by interleaving um, uh, a very um, narrow pulse or narrow band pulse between the two to isolate that one or adding a little bit of bandwidth onto these two tones and that'll basically start to push down these ambiguities we can localize the correct one um, and then we can track that one and again, this isn't a waveform we would use for a non-cooperative operation. You wouldn't send it out, reflect off some target with a lot of scattering centers and try to figure out what it is because all these ambiguities would fall on top of one another. We can use it here because it's a cooperative system. So let's look at the um, use of this in a software-defined radio. So this is a, a Edis X310 USRP. Um, it's got an, uh, an operational bandwidth of six gigahertz, but each up converter has 160 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, but in fact, this two-tone waveform gives us a really nice way of using far less bandwidth um, than even this, this system uh, has. And in fact, what we're doing is generating just two tones at baseband, upconvert them to two different carrier frequencies. We combine them in air, send that over to our second node. I'm showing a corner reflector here, but this would be our second node with an active retransmitter, which is what we use in our hardware systems. That's, re that's collected by the receiver. And so each receiver has this two tone waveform. Each of these tones has this relative phase information that we're after that we got from the delay, the propagation here. So that's what we need to estimate that, that uh, delay between them. What we can do is individually down convert each of these two tones. Now, once we've done that, their phase information is preserved. Now I can digitally reconstruct my two tone signal the match filtering operation and I get the same accuracy I would get if I were to generate this directly and sample it directly. And I can do this with very, very little information. These are just two tones. And so I really don't need, you know, even, you know, kilohertz of bandwidth really in order to do this. Um, I think, you know, in this case we use maybe a couple of megahertz uh, sample rates, um, but you really don't need even that much uh, to do this. So what does that look like in terms of the actual accuracy? Um, so here we're showing a tone spacing up to 300, 400, 500 megahertz. And again, these, these channels are only 160 megahertz bandwidth. So we're really just taking these two channels and starting to separate them out. We can do that because of the benefits of this spectrally sparse waveform. There's nothing in between these two tones that we have to generate or receive. So we can separate them out to these, you know, basically arbitrarily large tone separations only within the limits of, of the operational bandwidth of our transceiver and in the operational bandwidth of our antennas. And we're getting, you know, sub millimeter uh, type ranging accuracy, so 500 micrometer uh, accuracy. This will give us about 90% coherent gain up to 40 gigahertz. So um, this ranging system works um, exceedingly well. Our SNR in this case is, you know, on the order of 20. 
Um, and again, for a you know for a radar operation, that's kind of that's a pretty sporty SNR. It's pretty high SNR. But for um, our system here, this is a cooperative system. We're sending out a signal. It's going to be actively retransmitted from that second node. So we're going to get an increase in the gain. So we don't have a one over R to the fourth dependence in the power like or the signal energy like we do in a radar operation. Here we have only one over R squared. And so we can get to these much higher SNRs um, very appreciably. We're going to have these cooperative systems and they can maintain this SNR. This is actually very reasonable to do. And so we can get to these, you know, sub millimeter type accuracies uh, using the spectrally sparse waveform, um, which will allow us, uh, what this again is allowing us to do is align these signals. When they arrive at our destination, they are aligned in phase um, such that we get that coherent superposition. And again, this, 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 as it's uh, in, as our results show here, this would support up to 40 gigahertz um, just on its own if there were no other errors. So we wanted to test this out in a distributed beam forming system. So we're just looking at the position estimation. estimation. So this, this really challenging aspect of estimating the separation between the platforms as they move. So in this case, we had two um, transmitters, one gigahertz continuous wave transmitters. They were uh, frequency locked by a cable. Um, we had a target in the far field, which is just monitoring the power. So this is just a, a, um, a, a spectrum analyzer, just looking at the power received. And we moved one of the nodes at a bit of an angle. And what that allowed us to do is change the distance of the second node to the target or to the destination without occluding this first one. And um, I'm going to jump over to the results slide first. So when we implement this beamforming operation and we just move one of the nodes, we don't do anything else. We get this destructive and constructive interference plot as is shown here. And this is what we'd expect, right? We're sending out two, two signals, two sinusoids from these um, transmitters. As this one moves a little bit closer to the target, those sinusoids are going to start to shift. So they'll go in and out of phase. And so that's exactly what we expect to see here. So. We implemented our ranging system on this um, uh, moving node. It measured the distance uh, to the other node and updated its phase in accordance with that um, with that motion. And that's what's shown here on the red line. So now we can see that it's basically maintaining that steered beam uh, throughout the measurement. Um, and this is without any feedback from that receiver. This is just monitoring the power. So completely open loop. Um, distributed beam forming. And so very exciting uh, results uh, for us when we first saw this. We, we tested it out by manually um, measuring the separation using a laser range finder and then um, and then um, uh, uh, correcting the phase manually. And that's what's shown here in the, um, sorry, that's in the red line. The blue line is our, is our ranging system adjusted one. You can see it matches uh, very closely. We also tried to steer a null, and um, in this case, we had two nodes. We actually got 15 dB null steering. Um, steering a null is, is really, really hard to do in distributed phase arrays because these small, these small errors can um, cause huge impacts on nulls. So if you think about it, if I've got a large collection of, of transmitters, they're sending out signals. When I talk about, sending a, when I talk about steering a null, what I'm really relying on is that all these signals are going to cancel out at a given direction. What that means is if even one of them is off and not canceling perfectly, your null is pretty much gone. With the beam steering operation, if you've got 10 nodes and one of them isn't working so well, you still got nine steering that beam, so it works pretty well. But if you've got 10 steering a null, and one of them doesn't work so well, suddenly your null is gone. So null steering, null steering is, ex is ex extremely hard to do. Um, with two elements, it's, it's reasonable because you've really only got, you know, uh, two, two places for error. So if the beam steering is working, the null steering should also work. And so that's what we're seeing here. But generally, it's, a, it's extremely difficult to do. Um, and so this measurement is, 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 was, was great because we saw that this ranging system works, works very, very well. We can move this node. Um, it can change that phase in response to that motion. Um, but what we also wanted to implement was something that's completely wireless. As I mentioned, these nodes were um, locked by a cable. Their oscillators were locked, so that frequency drift wasn't corrected. We aligned the initial phases, but not, the frequency drift was, was manually corrected by a cable. So we wanted to look at how we could do that wirelessly. And the approach that we used builds on this spectrally sparse waveform. So we're, we're already sending out these two tones and what we wanted to look at was something similar for the frequency locking. Um, and the waveform that we use um, in, uh, essentially takes two tones and we separate them by the frequency reference that we're looking for, in this case, 10 megahertz. On one of the nodes, we have a um, self mixing circuit as we call it. This two tone signal is received by the antenna. We, some gain and then we split it into two 
uh, arms and we mix it against itself in a mixer. So the output, um, the intermediate frequency output on this has this beat frequency, this 10 megahertz. It also has some higher order harmonics. We filter those off with this filter, but then we get this nice 10 megahertz reference out. Um, and then we can direct that to a phase lock loop or something else to, to lock our oscillators. And in this case, for our um, Edis USRP um, software defined radios, this just goes to the reference input port. And it locks the oscillators very well when we do this. It's just a nice one way uh, frequency synchronization approach. And I'm showing the, the hardware system here. The other benefit of this is we can add it onto our ranging waveform without really any impact on the ranging system, on the ranging performance. So if I have a two-tone waveform, I can modulate one of them with that 10 megahertz. This still looks largely like a two-tone waveform in terms of that second moment. And so the ranging accuracy really is not impacted and it allows us to do joint um, uh, high accuracy ranging and frequency transfer. So we implemented these again in software defined radio. Um, we have two nodes of this. This is completely wireless in this case. So we're transmitting a signal uh, from our master to our second or to, from our primary node to our secondary node. This has our ranging waveform and this 10 megahertz reference. Um, so the secondary node uh, locks its oscillator and retransmits the ranging signal. Prim primary node uh, corrects uh, its phase in response to the motion of the secondary node. Then they're both um, sending out signals to this receiver again. This re receiver is just, uh, just monitoring the power. So in this case, um, we're moving the secondary node over one full cycle of the wavelength, but we actually get two nulls. And the reason for that is not only is the transmitter moving, but now our frequency reference is going over a longer distance. We actually get twice the phase rotation. Um, so when we implement the phase, we just multiply it by two. What we can see is we get this um, blue line here. This is with our um, completely wireless phase locking. You can see it's well above that 90% maximum um, or 90% uh, threshold value that we're looking for. So this is a fully wireless, completely open loop distributed beam forming system. And um, again, relying on this high accuracy ranging and this wireless frequency transfer in order to align and to align the phases of our signals and to make sure that they stay aligned. So this is a building block for these larger, um, for, for larger arrays for more, uh, arrays with more elements. This provides sort of the fundamental um, uh, building block that you need for that coherent backbone that would implement these larger arrays. So I, it's important, I think, to talk before we talk about some additional challenges to, to outline some of the ways that you can implement distributed beam forming um, in various manners without, uh, without all the synchronization that we've been talking about. So for example, if we only wanna do um, uh, receive side beam forming, if we only want um, to receive signals and cohere on receive, there's a lot more we can do with, with less information. Um, so in this case, we've got a collection of nodes. They are receiving some signal from an emitter. What we want to do is fuse the data um, from these, these five nodes in this case and to get a beam steering operation. And so we can do this with actually very little information if they're only frequency locked. Um, what we can do is something as simple as just a phase estimation on the received signals and shift them in phase. And then we can get from sort of a collection of uncoordinated signals to this nice beam formed received signal. Again, only this is only based on frequency locking and then, um, you know, doing some signal processing on the receiver on the received signals. So this works, you know, this works very well um, if you've got um, enough information. So we have to have them uh, actually it has to be time aligned in, in some sense as well. So we know we're looking at the same signals, but aside from that frequency alignment is all that's needed, but it's uh, it's only on receive. But if we've got a system that is, um, you know, uh, that allows us to receive these signals and, and fuse them, something like this can allow us to do um, a distributed receive side beam forming operation. This is very similar to like a digital array um, beam steering uh, operation. But there are also things that we can do if we've only got something like uh, range estimation. So in this case, we've got a transmitter and it's sending out a signal to some destination. And what we've implemented here is an active repeater that is only collecting the signal and then retransmitting it with a phase um, offset. And so what this system does is measures its distance to this transmitter, estimates the phase that it would need um, to perform a beam steering operation, and just updates that in this um, uh, in this phase here. In this case, it doesn't have to be frequency locked because it's not up converting or down converting. It doesn't have to be time aligned as long as it's within some limitations of how far you need to be from the transmitter. Um, and what it 
what it allows us to do is to either boost the signal. So I'm showing the two here. There's a little bit of a delay in the repeater. This has to do with you know how far away it can be. We can boost that signal or we can null it. And um, if we look at what happens with uh, data as we're putting it through, this is the bit error, bit error ratio. And we want this to be very low uh, for a high reliability communications signal. So if we um, have them both transmitting, have the, this transmitter sending a signal and have our um, repeater boosting the signal coherently, we get a very low number of errors. If we rotate it so it's 180 degrees out of phase, we get sort of this you know, noise out of it. So the, again, the nice thing about this is this is completely independent from the transmitter. This transmitter doesn't even know that, that this active repeater is there. Um, and it's just collecting that signal and retransmitting it. Again, using less information, um, but just like in the receive side beam forming operation, it has some limitations in terms of you know, how you can use it. Uh, but the point is that you know, as, as we look at uh, in the future towards moving towards distributed, fully distributed phased array operations, there's a lot of interim benefits that you can get um, interesting types of systems that can benefit from, benefit from the technology as it's being developed. These are just two examples of that. So there's a number of additional challenges. So we've talked about aligning the phase, we've talked about timing. There are also challenges that arise when we start envisioning what these distributed phase array systems are gonna look like and what they're, how they're going to be implemented. And a lot of these come into sort of application specific challenges. Um, so for example, if we've got a system that's gonna operate outdoors over long distances, what can happen is the ranging performance can, can change as a function of the environment. And so in order to address that, we looked at um, making an adaptive system, something that could monitor its performance and, and change in response to, um, uh, to the SNR changing, you know, if, the, if there's weather conditions uh, or things like that. And the two-tone waveform or especially sparse waveform actually has some benefits for adapti adaptivity in this case as well. And really what we're trying to do here is, you know, we're transmitting a signal, it's going out, we're showing environments here, but this is the reflection from our other node back to our receiver. What we want to do is make sure that when we're estimating the distance and locking the frequencies between these platforms that it remains stable in the presence of changing conditions. This will allow us to maintain a steered beam so we can have a high level of coherent gain in our distributed phased array. So when we look at you know, how our specially sparse waveform works, you know, what is the accuracy on our delay estimation? Let's talk about delay. Um, is It's inversely proportional to the signal to noise ratio and that mean squared bandwidth. And so our SNR is gonna be a function of our environment. So that's, that's shown here, this is the SNR. This is our system implemented over a hundred meter link on the roof of our engineering building. We're just looking at its performance over, over this is a 24 hour period. We've run this for up to, for weeks at a time. So the SNR varies, you know, due to just conditions out in the environment. And so what we can do is change the tone separation of our two-tone waveform to account for those differences in the signal-to-noise ratio. We have those two sort of knobs that we can turn to maintain the ranging accuracy. And so what's shown here is the frequency of one of those two tones, the second tone, the first one is fixed, this is our second one that's changing in response to the SNR. And so we can see when the SNR decreases, this tone increases. Um, and that'll reduce the, um, the variance on our estimate again. And um, what it looks like if we look at the beam steering performance is it's, it's very, very stable, even in response to this, this rapidly varying uh, signal to noise ratio. So if we hadn't implemented um, this active control, this active ad adaptive uh, loop, then this would be varying around just as much as the SNR that's shown here. But with this type of uh, adaptive approach, we can maintain very, very stable performance in changing conditions. Uh, and again, this kind of leverages that sp the spectral sparsity of that waveform. So that's one example of sort of an application specific challenge that comes up. Another one is, you know, scalability. So we've, we've talked about two nodes and showing the distributed beam forming between two nodes, but how do we get to larger and larger arrays? And one of the approaches that I think is very interesting um, in this direction is, um, is, is distributed uh, optimization, or, or in this case, what we use is, is a consensus averaging, a consensus-based uh, synchronization of the nodes. Um, and so I'll just talk about frequency in this case. And one of uh, frequency is a nice one to look at in a consensus-based uh, distributed operation because it's a nice single value. We want all the nodes to be at the same frequency. And so the approach that we look at is based entirely on, on local um, connectivity or local broadcast of our information between the nodes. So 
node nine, for example, is is talking with just a handful of nodes here, five other nodes, and it's sending its frequency to those nodes. Those nodes are sending their frequencies to node nine. Each of these nodes collects its neighbor's frequencies, calculates an average, updates its frequency to that average. And as a function of time, that will eventually converge to a consistent frequency. And if we look at the um, uh, the residual phase, and this is assuming that we've got um, drift in the oscillators, so quartz crystal oscillators, we can we can stay within that 18 degree um, threshold, uh, basically maintain that convergence even in the presence of dynamics. And so we've implemented this in various forms. I'm showing a 900 megahertz, uh, just very low cost uh, node system here. We've got four nodes um, in sort of the circular topology, and it converges to this um, uh, very low frequency error between them, which is commensurate with a very high level of a coherent gain as long as we're updating at a very um not a doesn't have to be a very high rate you know 20 hertz so we're talking you know still in this um tens of milliseconds type range um which is commensurate with the um uh, input with the um uh, update rates that we would need based on uh, platform vibration and phase noise that we talked about earlier um, and so this this distributed approach is a really nice way of building on these sort of fundamental uh, technologies that we've shown earlier and really scaling up to much larger numbers of elements. So another challenge, and I alluded to it earlier, is grading lobes. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a sparse array. We've got these grading lobes that go in a lot of different directions. And so if we've got like two transmitters and a receiver and we're sending a, a signal to this one transmitter and our beam, we're going to have all these other beams um, that will be sending information outside as well. Oftentimes, we want to um, mitigate these grading lobes. You know, they're, they're a function of baseline. So as we go to wider and wider um, arrays, we're going to have more and more lobes. So we want to look at how do we mitigate those in a lot of cases. You know, we want to ensure that we're not sending energy into other directions. A typical way of doing this is to look at something like, you know, things like bandwidth. Um, because as I mentioned, null steering is really, really hard to do in a distributed phase array. So we want to look at other ways of, of mitigating it. So bandwidth is one of the typical ways of doing it. We increase the bandwidth, these grading lobes will tend to move as a function of angle. And so over the course of the waveform, we've got a wide band waveform, it'll kind of suppress these, these side lobes. The, the challenge with that is it takes a lot of bandwidth to do it. And if you've got a really widely sparse um, array, it's really hard to get rid of all the grading lobes in and around the main beam. So it's it's kind of a challenging thing to do. It works in some specific cases, but not, not all cases. So what we're interested in is looking at the presence of these grading lobes, rather than trying to mitigate them, what are some of the approaches we could use to actually leverage those grading lobes? And so this is where some very interesting um, new techniques or research directions come out of this, um, uh, this research area. So this grading lobe pattern is going to exist. And so the first thing we looked at was using this grading lobe pattern and looking at what happens when a target is moving through this grading lobe pattern in an angular direction. And it turns out if we process the signals correctly, so sending out just a continuous wave signal we're receiving on this with this interferometric grading low pattern, and if we process them by, by correlating those two signals, multipl multiplication and integration, what we actually get is a response on this signal that's got a frequency that's proportional to the angular velocity of this target. It's also proportional to the separation of the elements and inversely proportional to the wavelength. So if we look at, you know, the the formula for the Doppler shift, this is proportional to the radial velocity over the wavelength. This interferometric frequency shift is proportional to the angular velocity times the baseline over the wavelength. So mathematically, it's almost identical to this Doppler shift. And in fact, what it allows us to do is to directly measure angular velocity of moving targets in exactly the same way that we would do with a Doppler radar. Just doing a frequency estimation, we get angular velocity out of it. So this shows an example of that. We've got a person walking towards a 30 gigahertz interferometric radar. We get this nice Doppler shift. Um, and because they're coming towards the radar, there's no angular velocity. There's no shift in the, um, in the, in the interferometric response. Jumping down here, if a person is moving 90 degrees, you know, sort of in a line like this relative to the interferometer, we get you know, basically no shift on the Doppler, um, but we get a shift on the interferometer. And if they're moving 45 degrees, we get a shift on both of them. So what this provides us using this distributed aperture provides us a direct method of this multidimensional velocity estimation. And this is something that radars traditionally can't do. They measure range, Doppler, and angle. So now with this technique, we can also measure angle rates. So, you know, range, range rate, angle, angle rate. So it really is sort of a fourth basic radar measurement. 
Um, and again, basically, we're we're leveraging the spectral the, the spatial sparsity of this of this uh, aperture. You know, it's giving us this um, nice grading low pattern. That's what's allowing us to do this type of measurement. So that's one example. There are other interesting things that manifest when we look at having more and more elements in the array. And one of them is that you know this grading low pattern matches to uh, effectively a spatial frequency. So the spatial frequency is number of cycles per radian. And it turns out this spatial frequency is a sample of the two-dimensional Fourier transform of whatever the scene is you're looking at. So if I've got a lot of elements and I've got a lot of different baselines, I've got a lot of different spatial frequencies. Now I've got a sampling function that can collect information in the Fourier transform domain of that scene. What that means is if I collect enough of those samples, I can perform an inverse Fourier transform and I can actually have an imager with the sparse array. This is, this is basically, it is what they do with these large radio astronomy arrays where they have many, many, many elements. They're um, correlating the responses pairwise. That's a sample of the Fourier domain, um, uh, spatial frequency domain, and then they're doing an inverse Fourier transform to get an image. Um, and so we started looking into how we could do this in a, in a smaller setting and do it with um, active systems. Because one of the issues with like radio astronomy arrays is they have to have very sensitive receivers. They're detecting thermal radiation that's very low in power. So we looked at implementing a trans, an active system that uses noise transmitters to mimic thermal radiation. We have to specify their, their bandwidth and their um, locations appropriately. But when we do that, we can get to a system that allows us to do this type of Fourier domain imaging. And we can do it exceedingly, exceedingly fast. Actually, this is a, some results from a, an imaging system, this imaging system here that operates at 650 frames per second. So orders of magnitude faster than any other millimeter wave imager, imager in the literature. And that's because we're leveraging this, this sparsity to do a Fourier domain measurement. And we combine that with this active transmission of incoherent radiation. So um, again, leveraging the sort of the, um, the structure of these distributed arrays allows us to do this, you know, very, very fast imaging. Building on the, um, as I mentioned, the grading lobes, as you um, change the um, band or the frequency, the grading lobes start to move. You can also do that if you move one of the platforms. So using spatial dynamics, so as I mentioned, these platforms could be in motion. This is where things um, we think it's uh, very interesting. So when we do move one of these platforms, these grading lobes will tend to move. What we can do is look at the information that's transmitted in these in these side lobes. And if you design it appropriately, the main beam won't change as we change, as we move these elements, but the side lobes do. And what that does is adds an additional modulation onto the data. So if you look at the information, it's uncorrupted in our main beam, it becomes corrupted in our side lobes. So even though we're sending energy in these other directions, this, these dynamics in the system allow us to um, mitigate the transfer of information in those directions. So this is um, supported by this dynamic array pattern shown here. And um, this is uh, shown the bit error ratio from this experiment here, two nodes, they're moving, one's moving relative to one another, they're wirelessly coordinated. And even though there's a lot of energy going into these side lobes from the grading lobes, or in these, these regions from the grading lobes, the information is unrecoverable. Or it's only recoverable in that main beam. So as I mentioned, grading lobes are really hard to mitigate distributed phase arrays, but this shows an approach that we can use to actually mitigate the transfer of information in those directions. Uh, and building on the dynamics and the uh, imaging aspects, um, we can look at some, some very interesting imageless object detection. Again, using the sparsity of this array, the Fourier sampling and as we rotate this array for example this was one with rotation dynamics we trace out the Fourier we trace out the point at which this um, sample is measuring in the Fourier domain so this actually can be very useful when we've got structures with with sharp um, edges so if we've got you know this might be uh, a weapon someone's holding you know under their shirt and so contraband type detection um, and whenever there's a sharp edge, we're going to get a really broad spatial frequency response. And by measuring this sort of ring in the spatial frequency domain, we can determine where these sharp responses are. We can determine what type of shape is there without ever actually imaging it. Um, and this, is, this allows us to do a lot of uh, very interesting types of things like contraband detection, uh, estimation or uh, classification of ground scenes uh, without ever actually having to do uh, imaging. And so, again, this is leveraging the sparsity of this array um, and just, you know, how the radiation pattern manifests from this array and then using the dynamics of the system. 
So that was a couple of examples of, of additional challenges in this area and some of the new sort of research uh, uh, directions that you can go with these distributed phased arrays. Um, and so, you know, what I wanted to summarize, uh, you know, here at the end of the talk, or I'd like to summarize is that, you know, the technologies have been developed to address these most fundamental aspects, most fundamental challenges in distributed phase arrays. There's a number of secondary challenges that still remain. We talked on, talked about a few of them, but there are, there are many other things. They often tend to be application specific, um, but these, these fundamental ones, you know, as I mentioned, are, have been addressed. And so the building blocks are there. And again, the sort of unique aspect, unique nature of these distributed phase arrays gives us a lot of opportunities for some really unique uh, new research directions. Um, I wanna uh, conclude by thanking my, my research team, my PhD students and postdocs, they're, they're outstanding. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a great group of students uh, working on um, this and other research projects. Um, my sponsors who have supported us um, um, in the past um, you know, number of years on all these uh, uh, topics. And so we have some very outstanding um, sponsors as well. Um, and so last, I'd like to thank you all for listening. I, uh, again, really uh, appreciate uh, being here with you today. Um, I'm happy to take questions now. You can also email me questions here um, at my IEEE uh, email address. So thank you. Uh Thank you, Dr. Nancy. It was an excellent talk, and uh, this floor is open for questions from the audience. Hello. <laughs> I don't see any question in the chat box, but uh, you can ask the audience. It's the floor is open for questions, so you can ask questions if you have any. Oh, I see someone trying to talk. I think you're muted. Can you hear me? Can you repeat that? Oh, still not hearing you. I'm, I'm sorry. I can see you. Jim, I know if that's you. I can see you talking, but I can't hear you. Hello, I can't hear you. Hello, uh, am I audible yes. now? Yes, you're audible. Yes. Yeah, so my, my question is basically very fundamental. So this uh, phase array work that you are doing and you have presented, you have shown multiple applications, uh, you know, mainly the far field application and etc. So what is the uh, basic difference with uh, this distributed uh, phase array with the conventional phase array? So this is the first part of the question. Yeah, so the the real difference is that, you know, with a traditional phased array and it's platform centric, there's a lot of intrinsic knowledge into how to adjust the phases of our transmitters to get that phase coherent, you know, phase from. Um, the elements are fixed, the path lengths between them are well characterized. Now we no longer have that. So we have to build a wireless backbone that implements that. You know, in effect, what we'd like it to be is completely transparent. We've got a system that is beam forming, um, but it, it just looks like a single large system. So really that's kind of the crux of it is we want to mimic that performance of the system um, wirelessly by building up this, this sort of wireless backbone. Okay, so uh, can you compare uh, this approach with the conventional approach in terms of cost, complexity, and also, you know, the, the you know, fund requirement, et cetera, in general, uh, because, yeah, so, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when we look at things like increasing the capabilities, where we really think this this has benefits is in terms of, of cost for, for large, for large scalability. So if we're looking at something like really, really large phased arrays, there's kind of this, 
almost nonlinear impact if we go to really large arrays. You have to deal with uh, thermal aspects, efficiencies, you know, power handling, data throughput, and all that. When we look at the distributed op op uh, the distributed uh, topology, we've got a number of smaller nodes. They could be existing systems, and so we could retrofit potentially even existing systems with this wireless backbone to get them to coordinate with one another. We could have just a collection of them and we're building the same one. So when we increase the capabilities, we're only adding these low cost nodes to the array. So it becomes more of a linear scalability and capability and you know in the in the in the capability and the cost. And we don't mm -hmm. have to deal with a lot of the things that you would have in single platform systems. So I think that's where a lot of the significant benefit comes from. There are also these things that you know almost intangibles that you really can't compare, right? The single point of failure. If you have a single system and it fails. You know your system's gone. You have a collection of nodes, and you know mm -hmm. a couple of them fail. You've still got the rest of the system, so it's it's much more highly reliable and adaptable. So I think those things are a little bit harder to sort of one to one compare, but they're very significant benefits of this type of topology. Right, right. Just one more point from my side. Even though this is not part of part of your presentation, but I just want to uh, make a I mean. Hear from you regarding a comparison, the time modulated array, uh, where we have uh, the concepts of switching without requiring the phase shifters or attenuators, etc. So, uh, how do you compare this time modulated array and the type of work that you presented? Because TMA is also considered to be a less less expensive option, uh, you know as far as the beam scanning is concerned. Yeah, so we, we've looked at things like, um, you know, comparison to time modulated arrays, particularly with like directional modulation. So basically what we're showing mm -hmm. here is a directional modulation approach, you know, and that has been implemented mm -hmm. in time modulated arrays. The, the real difference here um, that the um, degrees of freedom that we have are a little bit more expansive than what you would get in a traditional phased array, in particular because I can now move this element. I can move all the elements. That's something I can't do in a fixed array. Once I can move those elements, I can add additional dynamics into the system and I can maintain all the gain. So if I have time modulated arrays, for example, and I'm switching elements on and off, I have to give up gain. Mm -hmm. right? That's intrinsic to it. I'm losing gain because I'm turning elements off. I don't have to do right. that. Here. They can all run at the same time and I can move them. I can add those dynamics. So in concept, in theory, this should get you better gain for the same type of um, effect. The challenge with these, of course, is that now we've got physical dynamics. That's often at a different type of scale, different way of implementing things than you would with a, you know, with electronic, with, with electronic dynamics. So the scale of it and how you do it, you know, the mechanics of it are a little bit different, but in concept, it allows for, you know, a more efficient type of uh, beam forming operation in that sense. That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for, for addressing this. Uh, over to you, Professor Siddiqui. I think there are a few questions in chat box now. Uh, I can see a raised hand from the sort of Mahadevan. Yeah. Yes, sir, please. See the... My my question is this conventional digital beam forming gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay, so compared to that, is this as flexible as that? Is this as flexible as, as what? I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, is it as flexible as what we have for a the digital beam forming where you can see it change anything and you can get the beam the way they want, etc. Move oh. anywhere we want. All those flexibilities are already available in that, and then with uh, with an adaptive system in that, it is really very very useful. So how is this uh, new concept which you have uh, brought here, the one is really going to help because the hardware seems to be much more in this particular case than the others. Yeah. So in this case, um, you know, compared to like a traditional, you know, phased array that you can still do the beam steering, you can still do all the adaptive processes. The only difference is the sparsity in the array. So you may have to deal with the grading lobes as we're talking about. Um, but you can get to this much greater signal gain by aggregating these these platforms than you could ever do with a single platform. So, you know, when we look at sort of how do how do we compare them, you wouldn't use a distributed phased array 
you know, on the surface, if you've got something that's not moving, like an airport radar or something like that, or, a, you know, large military surface radar, this is more for these applications where you really want capability that's very hard to get with a larger and larger aperture. But it's again, it's kind of like a backbone, right? It's a this is a this is a wireless backbone that allows face coherent operation. So any technology that we've implemented in in phased arrays, you can implement in this. It may be different subtleties, of course, as I mentioned in the radiation pattern, but there's there's no limitation on how you can implement it. This is actually much more akin to a, um, a digital a digital array. So each element has its own. Um, uh, ADC, it has its own DAC. So really, you've got all the flexibility of a digital array. It's just in a distributed topology. So actually, when the system really starts operating and becomes more popular, I think it will become clear. That's what uh, it looks like now. Because yeah. the majorly, as it is, you, if you see, you find that the hardware elements are much more. That is what we could immediately guess. It, it can be. So there's there are some hardware aspects that you may need. Some of them we may not. So if you've got systems that are already communicating with one another, for example, we can potentially use this spectrally sparse waveform in those channels and in that hardware that's already there and do this all in processing. So that is possible. What, what we're showing, yeah, definitely requires additional hardware, but I think there's possibilities to do this with very minimal hardware impact in specific applications. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else with any questions? Yeah, I I have a question. Shall yes. I proceed? Yes, yeah. please, please. Yeah. This uh, from uh, one single element to distributed element, and we have a number of elements more. It is going to introduce more and more variables. That is phase variation, amplitude variation, then a spurious signal from outside. All these are going to affect the system, total system. When it is deployed, total system. That means constraints are more, variables are more, and you have to optimize all these things. Shall we can use any intelligent system with the individual uh, array element? Yeah, so I think you're referring to, um, you know, when I talked earlier on about how we're characterizing these, you know, there's there's a number of different phase, number of different terms that roll into this in terms of the specifics of the application, just like you're saying. Um, and so some of these things, yeah, you can control, you can use sort of knowledge of the individual elements to try to calibrate or correct or, or characterize a lot of those um, those aspects. Um, Again, I, you know, I, these tend to be more application specific when we're looking at what type of platform is it going to be on? Is it going to be moving very rapidly? Is it going to be a system that has a lot of other um, systems on it that could cause spurious signals, as you're saying? Or is it something that's much you know, simpler? It's only got one transceiver on it. Maybe it's on a drone or something like that that has, you know, sort of a, a smoother profile or, or less, you know, less hard, less other wireless systems or fewer wireless systems on it. So I think these all kind of come into these sort of um, uh, secondary type problems that I've kind of alluded to. Um, I think we're trying to show that these fundamental problems can be addressed, but you're absolutely right that this, this total error budget has to include everything that's going to be on the specific um, system that you're building. Um, we do think that there you know, will be solutions or already are solutions to those that could leverage things like you know knowledge on the individual platforms. I think that's a really good way of approaching it. Um, but uh, now that these sort of fundamental um, problems are being addressed, we feel like these are these are the appropriate questions to start asking. You know, how do we deal with some of these additional um, errors that are going to pop up? So I think that's a very relevant question for, you know, wh where does this go next? What do people need to work on next? And it is looking at, I want to I want to implement this on this type of a system. What else are we going to have to deal with? How can we correct and adjust for those additional errors? I think that's um, you know I think that's the direction that the research is is going to be going in. So a very good question. Yeah. Second question. This is uh, is it more uh, uh, this performance will be affected by selective fading? This will be going to affect selective fading. Oh, fading. Because yeah. it is distributed, spatially distributed. So yeah. selective fading, how it is going to affect that? 
Yeah, definitely. So we we didn't talk about um, we didn't talk about multipath, but if I jump back to uh, where is it? So here we go. So closed loop and open loop. The problem with open loop is it's not inherently correcting for beam steering between the nodes and the target. So if you've got different fading channels between them, that can be an issue. If you've got um, you know, multipath between the nodes, that can also be an issue. So that's definitely an open challenge, uh, something we've uh, we have started looking at. Um, but certainly, once we start, you know, if you've got um, satellite aircraft, you know, or, or satellite platforms or aircraft, um, it's a little bit less of an issue. But uh, some top, some applications, particularly on the surface, multipath and fading is going to be an issue. Good question: uh, Is that uh, anyway for the digital modulation schemes? And we use it because uh, uh, data transmission or telemetry, when it is using uh, phase modulation, digital phase modulation. So, is it uh, having any more serious problem than a single element? Can you repeat that? Pardon? I'm sorry. Could you re could you repeat the question? This is modulation, digital modulation, because. All the carriers will be modulated. modulation. So doing... I am talking about yeah. the modulation, phase modulation. Yeah. Digital uh, modulation. On the, on the transmitters to the to the target, right? What do we do when we have modulation on it? Right? So yeah, yeah it's mo modulation, if I if I understand you know you're correctly. Once we start modulating the signals, we need to worry about you know the alignment of the timing. We didn't we didn't talk about that in this this presentation, but getting the information to overlap is very critical. And so you have to have a time alignment, a time synchronization approach as well. Um, and we do have some work on that, but for in the interest of time, we didn't cover it here. There are other technologies, other groups that have done time synchronization because you need that for closed loop and open loop, um, and uh, various topologies that could be implemented there. But it is it is very important. Once you start adding modulation, you know these waveforms or these symbols. They can they can be mismatched by a number of cycles as long as the cycles are in phase, right? That carrier needs to be in phase, but I could be off by a number of cycles on either end, and that's okay as long as most of the information is still there. So that's actually a different problem than the phase carrier synchronization. So they can be implemented in different parts of the system. Uh, so in fact, things like time alignment usually happens in the um, processing side, whereas the, the the carrier alignment can be done at the hardware level. So it's just Tends to be what we focused on, but yeah, time alignment is is important. Something that has to be implemented once you once you start adding modulation. I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor oh, Siddiqui. Ah, uh, yes, um, I think there's one question from uh, Mr. Deepankar Shah. Uh, he has asked how to control the grating lobes in this type of distributed phased arrays. So the grading lobes are going to be um, defined by the frequency, of course, but basically the electrical separation of the platforms and their sort of rotation angle. So if I go to um, let me jump down to the slide here. So in this case, I've got two elements. They're separated by a certain certain separation, and I have this grading lobe pattern that matches you know, um, this far field sort of grading low pattern. So this is sort of the, um, uh, uh, the, the, this is that sinusoidal pattern sort of, you know, um, uh, on this, on the surface in the far field. So it's, de it's dependent by the separation of those. So the wider I separate them, the more grading lobes I'll get. So one wavelength up to 15 wavelengths, I'm gonna get more and more grading lobes. So it's dependent on the electrical separation. But in space, it's also dependent on the rotation angle of this baseline. So as I start changing this angle, the direction of these grading lobes will also change. And so if I've got a large collection of elements and I cross correlate them pairwise, I'm going to get these grading lobe patterns that kind of manifest in all sorts of different areas. Um, so that's from a two element perspective. Once we start adding more and more elements, you get something a bit more diffuse. And so it's a little bit less like grading lobes than just sort of a mixture of side lobes and other grading lobes. You still get these very high levels from time to time, but it's not as distinct as grading lobes. Um, and so this comes into, you know, really the specifics of how the elements is or how the array is is oriented um, electrically. 
Thank you. Uh, I think there, there are a couple of questions in chat box. Uh, yes, can you please read them? Let's give them. See if I can find the chat. One second. Yeah, there's one from Pallavi Nair, and she asked, "Can we use leaky wave antennas, which is frequency scanning antennas, instead of distributed phased arrays?" And can you tell me if there's any application on that? Yeah, so I think you could you could look at using so a leaky wave antenna. Any single antenna system is is not applicable to the distributed array concept because what we're looking at is separate wireless systems and coordinating those wirelessly now each system that's coordinated so each element in your distributed array could have any number of aperture on it this could be a single antenna it could be a dipole it could be a phased array it could be a leaky wave antenna they may have benefits for the operation of you know what you want the entire system to do certainly um, but in, in concept, you know, you know, I think a leaky wave antenna is a single antenna system. And so what we're looking at more is is aggregating the functionality of multiple antennas, regardless of what type of technology is used in the aperture. OK, um, I don't think yeah, we have any more questions. But I think there is one more question. On top of the, uh, uh, in the chat box. Can we see any more questions in the chat box? Uh, I also uh, am not seeing uh, the chat box. Okay, let me read out. Do you see that one? Okay, so LP, uh, I'm reading the question on behalf of Professor Siddiqui. How do you set the threshold level in case of radar application optimization of the signal level? Uh, okay. It is adaptive. Like, uh, so this is an adaptive. Is to me also. Do you see so that? How do we set Yeah. I, I didn't see that, but I could I could hear yeah, you. Even I can't see that question in the chat box. I think I, I think there is some uh, uh, issues with the uh, OX settings. Yeah, even your voice is uh, I, I should have read it out again. <clears throat> How do you uh, set the threshold level in case of radar applications for optimization of the signal level? Yeah, so I, I um, for optimization of the signal level. So if that's referring to the adaptability case, so our, our threshold levels in this case were based on a certain um, accuracy that we wanted uh, the system to maintain. And that comes down to what frequency do we want to operate at? So when we looked at those curves of how accurate do we need to estimate the distance between the platforms, we, we know what the standard deviation of our range estimate has to be. So there's actually two different ways that we looked at doing that. One was just measuring the um, standard deviation of our range estimates. We computed a bunch of range estimates, you know, 100 or so, and just had a running average of our standard deviation. As that standard deviation changed, we would increase or decrease the tone separation to account for it. Um, the problem with that is it you have to collect a lot of them in order to get good statistics. So what we actually did in this one here was a bit more of a direct way, which is actually just directly estimating the signal to noise ratio of that signal. And we know our waveform. We know once we know our signal to noise ratio, we can compute what our lower bound is. Now, when we're implementing the system, the lower bound never matches what we can actually implement. But for what we found in this system is the curves are the same. So we could calibrate those two so we knew what our performance was um, by just estimating the SNR. And so when we did that, when the SNR changed, we know we we're kind of moving up and down this performance curve. We could change the tone separation in response. So again, that all came from a certain frequency that we wanted to operate at um, or a certain probability of coherent gain that we wanted to operate at. So in this case, uh, I think this was at a one gigahertz frequency or is either one or 1 1.5. We have different thresholds for 70%, 80%, 90% of the coherent gain. So we have a range estimation accuracy in the system is, is based on that. Yeah, I think that addresses the query 
is there any more query? Because I do not see anything in the chat box. Yeah, nothing more, I think. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, if anyone has questions, you know, feel free to email me. Always happy to, uh, to, to chat over email. Um, so, uh, thank you, Dr. Nancer, and over to the organizers. Yes, Dr. Thank Shah you. and Dr. Afrin, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I, um, I really appreciate it. Um, great opportunity to, to talk with you all. So, yeah, back to you. Thank you, sir. I um, request all participants to turn on their cameras for a virtual photo shoot. If you want to be part of the report, which will be reported in MTCS magazine and our newsletter, please turn on your video. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Professor Anu Mohammad, Vice Chair at Actively APS Kerala Chapter, for the word of thanks. On behalf of M MTTS Kerala Chapter, we thank Professor Jeffrey for giving us this enlightened talk on distributed phase arrays, distributed beamforming, the parameters which we have, we need to con be considered for the realization of the session of the same, which are very needed for this. And I am very op optimistic that the students, definitely a few of our students will definitely will hook up on this area as the current uh current the topic is of that much interest in the current scenario we would like to thank siddiqui sir for being with us for all your supports to our region as well as sub chapters like us in all respects also special thanks for you sir for chairing this session i thank all the professional thank members from industry academia who took over their time and attended this DML and making it very effective. I am very happy that and appreciate the students for students and research scholars for attending this session. I urge the student community to join IEEE as Jeffrey Sar was mentioning and to enjoy the benefits technically as well as non-technically. Lastly, I thank the MTTS bearers APS to APS and MTT students for their immense back end support. I also, I would like to mention that do do keep stay tuned with us so that we will be coming with more such technical series as well as other activities for the benefits of the student community. Now over to Apren sir for further proceedings, if any. Uh, this is, thanks one, once again, uh, Professor Jeffrey and Professor uh, Siddiqui and all other distinguished uh, guests from industry and uh, my dear uh, students. So thanks once again. Uh, we will meet in somehow somewhere in uh, uh, I think uh, towards the end of the year in Bangalore or in Kerala, Professor Jeffrey and uh, and the Siddiqui sir is there during the July section 26th. We are meeting Professor Rachidigi in uh, Trivandra itself. Uh, and uh, all once again, uh, good morning and good evening to all. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Jeffrey. Thank you so much, Professor Siddiqui. We Thank really you. are to see you here in 2022 or latest in 2023 June, as, as we discussed.
Thank you. Forward Thank to you. it. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.